Okay, so today is Friday, May the 8th. Um, this is physiology. So today what I wanted to do, guys, was um, get a little bit more into the nervous system. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys. And I'm going to take us first to Schoology. Um, I think a lot of you guys are getting the handle of, of how these modules are working. And like I was telling Anna before you guys got here, a lot of people are working ahead at their own pace, which is, which is great um, for me and for everyone. But um, if you have any questions about the modules or anything, don't be afraid to reach out to me. But um, so what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna get into the notes a little bit. Um, I don't wanna lecture too long. I really wanna just answer questions for you guys, but I do wanna you know, connect to what we talked about on Wednesday uh, to the notes today, just because we did a really good example. I think it was Daisy that helped connect um, all these words together. So we'll expand upon that a little bit. Um, and then we'll look at some of the assignments. Actually, let's, let's go ahead and, and start with the assignments um, because um, some people already finished these actually. So for people that weren't here Monday and Wednesday, uh, there were two Zoom group discussion assignments. These are not graded. These are just meant for us to watch a video together and then just talk about it. But these are not graded assignments at all. I just like to have you guys interact. So we did two Zoom videos. It was this one on brain pop, on concussions, I mean. And then we did this other one on the nervous system. And then I individually assigned you guys these three. So these, whenever it says assignment with a due date, these are assignments that you do have to do on your own and are worth points. Uh, so if it doesn't have a due date like like this, it says Zoom groups. See, there's no due date and there's no um, there's no there's no um, rubric. So see how mine has the little rubrics for critical thinker and communicator. That's how you can tell that they're worth points. So these three you do have to do on your own. Um, so the first one is the watching assignment, and this is for your crash course, but it's more into the peripheral and the central nervous systems themselves. So it's just going deeper into what we already started talking about on Wednesday. Um, and again, I put a due date for that today, but again, don't worry too much. If you did it already, cool. If you wanna do it Monday, fine. Again, it, the grade's already cut off, so this will not impact the grade. Um, the other assignments that I'm gonna ask that you start to take a look at is the Nuzella article um, and I'm gonna ask one of you guys to, to do that for me, share your screen, because I want everyone to know what that article looks like. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And can I have uh, one of you, Anna, Daisy, or Damari, can one of you share your screen with us and open up that Newzella article? I wanna clarify some things, please. Who can do that for me? Who can share their screen with me, guys? I can do it. Okay, go ahead, one of you, please, and open up the Newzella article for those watching so they know what the article is. Okay, thank you, Daisy. So go ahead and click on Newzella. Very good. And did it open a new window? Yeah. Okay. Can you move this one? Because all we see is the old one. Minimize this. There it is. Okay, cool. So the article, um, go ahead and, uh, and click on it. So the name of the article, it's Brain, Spinal Cords, and Neurons. But remember, if you're reading at different levels, guys, it does change the title. Hold on that screen, Daisy, real quick. So um, it won't say the same title for all. So for the level that Daisy has it at, which I believe is the max, um, it's called brain, spinal cords, and neurons, but for other people, when they click it, it may just say central and peripheral nervous system, but it is the same article, okay? So again, uh, Daisy, can you hover over where it says uh, teacher and class? Just hover your mouse over it. So for those of you that um, haven't used Nuzella before, um, it says the name of the teacher. So for me, it says E. Trujillo, and then class, hover over that, Daisy. See where it says honors physiology, that's how you can tell it's mine, in case you're getting several articles like from your English classes or anything. But for me, can you, um, can you highlight the instructions, Daisy, and can you read them please? Because, there you go, can you read it? 
read the article at any reading level you want. Take the quiz, non-graded. Highlight and annotate article, non-graded. And submit a writing response to these ELA writing prompts and science writing prompts, graded. Yeah. Thank you. And so what I'm going to do is last time I did the writing prompt for, uh, so ELA, in case you don't know, is English language arts. That's the, the prompt that asks you usually just to summarize, you know, the article. But the science one is the more important one because that one actually asks you to use evidence to prove something about the article. So for this one, I'm going to do it as two separate writing prompts. And I think that's better for you because you'll get you'll get double the points for reading the same article, okay? So please note, you can exit Daisy, thank you so much. So please note that it is two uh, writing assignments. And so now I'll go into my Schoology so you can see that. Can you guys see Schoology? Do you guys see my Schoology? Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. Thank you. So like Daisy just read us, so I just called it um, the Nuzella article on central nervous system, but again, it has a different title like Daisy just showed you. So again, you're gonna do one for the ELA writing prompt and then one for the science. So the ELA is only gonna ask you to basically summarize the article, but because I want you to actually use evidence and prove to me you understand the nervous system, I'm gonna have you do the science writing prompt separately. Does that make sense, guys? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. So yeah. free, feel free to start those uh, uh, assignments for nervous system whenever you want. The um, formative assessment, again, is the quiz. I had set that quiz for next Monday. So those of you that are, you know, kind of working at your own pace, uh, you can take it. I'll, I'll actually have it fully published by like this weekend or so. So if you want to take it, please message me because again, this is self-paced now. You don't have to wait till that date. But if you don't feel comfortable with it, um, especially because this unit is a really long one, uh, then we can just wait till May 18th and we can all just do it together. So I'll, I'll leave it up to you. The discussion board, I haven't posted that one yet. I'm still trying to come up with something clever to do, but I'm going to make it something related to um, the nervous system, most likely how the pathways communicate, kind of like we saw in the video. So uh, these two are pending. Um, oh, actually the discussion board is pending, but the summative is gonna be pretty much like the summative you just did, uh, that little video project. I, I think that worked well. Um, I have about 75% of people that turned in that summative assessment. Some people are still working on it. But um, I think that worked well. So, so we'll see, okay? But for now, guys, you're free to start the first three folders. So let's go ahead and start with the red one for today. So I can um, just kind of connect the dots to where, to where we have been and where we're going. Um, so like I had said previously, or any questions so far about those assignments? Any questions, guys, so far? Are you guys good? I'm good. You're good? Okay, cool. So um, for this one, I'm gonna go ahead and pick up where I left off. <clears throat> and actually, I'll, I'll, I'll start with this because this was actually a really good summary. Let me go full screen because that's kind of bothering me. Let's go full screen on this. Um, hold on. All right, so I'm gonna open my page full screen for you guys. Okay, so where we left off last time is we were looking at this chart here and- It's frozen. Oh, it froze? Hold on, yeah. right, sorry guys. Um, this is not sharing. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. So where we left off last time, um, Daisy gave us a really good explanation as to how the different parts of the nervous system communicate. And we talked about the example from the video of the spider, you know, crawling up your leg. And we've been giving the example of like, you know, your hand touching a stove or you poking yourself. So Daisy, since you did that last time, can I ask maybe Damari or, or Anna to kind of... Uh, connect all of these words together to explain like uh, what would happen if Mr. Trujillo like stepped on a nail? How would my nervous system communicate and react? 
can Anna or, or Damari explain that to me, please, using this chart? So if Mr. Trujillo steps on a nail, okay. what happens? Okay. Okay. And Mr. If you step on a nail, then the peripheral nervous system is going to sense it, mm -hmm. the sensory neuron. And then the motor neuron is going to send a signal to up to the nervous system. And it's going to do an autonomic nerve, autonomic um, control. So it's going to be an unconscious control that you're just going to do it. Are you sure about that? So, so if I step on a nail, um, first of all, do I, am I just going to leave my foot there? No, you're going to move it. I'm going to move it, right? <laughs> so, so, but is that movement, Anna, is that autonomic? Remember, we mm -hmm. talked about the differences between conscious and unconscious or voluntary yeah. and involuntary. And I think it was you, Damari, that was asking about reflexes, right, Damari? Yeah. Okay, so check it out. Um, uh, let me let me explain a little bit more about reflexes, and I think that'll that'll kind of help make a little more sense. So, um, I added this new slide. Okay, so this is how a reflex works. Okay, so picture that you're in the doctor's office, and they have you on the table, and they're testing your nervous system. And one of the ways that they test the peripheral nervous system, guys, is with a, a reflex response, right? So they get you on a table. And they get a little hammer and you know they kind of like whoop, they hit you right here in the, in the kneecap you have uh, a long nerve uh, actually that runs uh, from from your sacrum all the way down to your foot so they hit that nerve and what happens is so you see where it says stimulus right let me go ahead and write on my screen so you can see it um okay so the doctor will administer a stimulus which in this case will be like a little like a little hammer right so they hit you and then here's your here's your knee. Oh my gosh, that's a weird knee. Okay, so they hit you on the knee, right? And then that that hitting of the nerve, we call that a stimulus, right? It's something that stimulates a response on something that we call a receptor. So a receptor in, in terms of the nervous system is something that receives a stimulus from the outside environment. Does that make sense, guys? So in Mr. Trujillo's example, what would the stimulus be and what would the receptor be for my little example of stepping on a nail? Stepping on the nail would be the stimulus. Okay, and what would the receptor be? The pain. No. It's the thing that receives the stimulus, like I said. So would that be your foot? It would be my foot, Damari, oh. exactly. It'd be my foot. So my foot is the receptor. And here, so stimulus would be the hammer. Receptor, and well, for this example about the knee, would be my knee. Okay, let's not confuse my examples. So for this example about, you know, your doctor's office, I'm using this first to explain the, the nail thing, okay? So in a, in a reflex, which is different than Trujillo stepping on a nail, but the way reflexes work is there's a stimulus, there's a receptor, and that receptor, aka your knee, sends a signal up through what we call a sensory neuron, which is the same as what you're saying, Anna, but let me show you the difference. So it sends a message to the sensory neuron to something called an interneuron. So inter, think of like in between, okay? Interneurons, what they do is they're kind of like the, the, the bridge between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, okay? So what this interneuron does, which you can see here in the spinal cord, right? Because a message of pain travels from my, from my bottom half, my leg, my foot, travels up to my spinal cord. In the spinal cord, you have these things called interneurons. But remember, the spinal cord, is that CNS or PNS, spinal cord? CNS? Yeah, it's CNS. It's peripheral. I mean, it's it's central nervous system, right? So the interneuron is the gateway between sensory neurons, and it it sends that message, which now is going to be the response called the motor neuron, and then that motor neuron causes an effect, and so we call that res so the response would be like the kicking of the foot, and the 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 muscle. And effectors in cases of reflexes 
are usually going to be muscles. Okay. A muscle, and we talked about um, effector muscles actually when we were on the muscular system, and I'm reusing that word again today. Uh, an effector is something that causes an effect. So the knee receives the stimulus, sensory neuron receives that message, sends it to the spinal cord, spinal cord tells, and again, notice that here I'm not saying brain, because this is different than Trujillo stepping on a nail. This reflex is involuntary because unlike Trujillo stepping on a nail, Anna, and I can choose to leave my foot on there in case I don't feel the pain for whatever reason, like paralysis, but in an involuntary response, I can't do anything about it. So the, the CNS, AKA in this case, the spinal cord, actually does the movement for me. It causes the effector, the muscle, to respond without your control. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. Okay, so this is very, very different than, um, than what, what we're talking about, which is Trujillo stepping on a nail. So let me go back to this. So on this, Anna, can you tell me why um, that example is not an example of autonomic nervous system now that I've explained a reflex? Because So why is me stepping on a nail and moving my foot, why is that not an example of autonomic? Or anyone? Why is that? Is it, is it because you're like taking control of where you're going to move your foot after? Exactly. Basically, Damari, because I'm consciously controlling my foot. Because think about this: if a if a if a paralyzed person, you know, some for some reason stabs their foot, they they wouldn't move. They wouldn't move their foot. Do you know why? Does anyone know don't why? You feel it? You don't feel because, it? Because they wouldn't feel it, right? So this is where the difference between CNS and PNS is so different because the, the, the nerves of the foot, the nerves of the hand, the nerves of everywhere but the brain and spinal cord, those we call the peripheral nervous system. And the peripheral nervous system, in the case of someone that gets paralyzed, right, if they, if they break their spinal cord and break, uh, you know, vertebra, uh, usually from like the C3 vertebra down, if they break any of those, they actually lose sensation and nervous system control for whatever nerve got damaged beneath it. And I think I sort of explained this, but let me say it again. So if a person becomes paralyzed, like from the waist down, for example, they can control everything above that break, but not anything beneath the break. So if I were to break my, uh, like one of my thoracic or lumbar vertebra and the spinal cord beneath it, I can still move my head, I can still move my arms, but I can't move things beneath it. So I would not be able to move my, my hand and foot. And so this is where the difference comes in, guys, between somatic and autonomic. Because in an autonomic nervous system response, like Anna was saying, um, or actually Damari was saying, you don't have any control over that. But in a somatic, you do have control. And so a person that steps on the nail can choose to move their foot or not. Does that make sense? <clears throat> okay. Yes. So now that we've reviewed this a little bit, thank you guys. Now that we've reviewed this a little bit, and I think I already talked about neurolation, um, neurolation, like I told you guys last time, just has to do with um, in the developing stage where your nervous system came from. Um, and I think we talked about this already, right? Sensation, response, and integration. We talked about this, right, guys? Yes. Yeah, we did, right? Okay, good. So I think this is where we are now. So um, I, I won't talk about this slide because you actually just explained it to me, guys, in, in, the, in, the, in here, in the reflex arc, but please look at it. This is my full explanation about a reflex. I just want to say one thing. Um, in terms of uh, sensory and motor, uh, what did we say sensory, what did we say sensation means exactly? In terms of nervous system, what does sensation mean? What does that mean? When we say sensation or senses or sensory? 
What does that mean, guys? Think about Your it. Five senses. And it has to do with the five senses, Anna. But look, if you look at this diagram of the reflexes and think about the example you illustrated for us about, you know, me stepping on a nail or your doctor giving you that uh, reflex response, um, senses really are, are, are more than just the five senses. What, are, what, what is sense? Think about it. You feel for me? <laughs> I don't know. It, it's, 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 how, it's how you pick up information about the environment. Yeah. But as a stimulus. So in terms of the five senses, Anna, like you were saying, what is the stimulus for taste? What's the stimulus for taste? Anyone, what's the stimulus for taste? Like food? Yeah, it's, 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 it's food, right? So, <clears throat> you know, your mouth starts watering, you smell your favorite food, ah, right, you start drooling. That's the stimulus. What's the stimulus for uh, smell? A scent? Yeah, it's the, the odors of the food, right? So, so sensation, guys, in terms of nervous system, is how we pick up information about the environment through stimuli or stimulus. The response, like we've been saying, is just the movement or the reaction. So in terms of like uh, touch, that one's easy, right? You poke yourself in the hand. The stimulus, like we said, is the poke itself. And the response is you're moving away, right? You're moving away or, or you burn your hand, you move away. And the integration, like we said, means how all of this stuff is communicated together. So like you saw in the example of, of, of this, the integration, that's what we call it an interneuron, has to do with how the two sensory and motor neurons communicate with one another. So um, for that reason, we say that um, sensory neurons, sensory neurons, guys, they have another name. Sensory neurons, we call them afferent nuance because they are affected, right? They are affected by a, what? What are sensory neurons affected by, did we say, in the case of me poking myself? What are sensory neurons affected by? An effector? A stimulus. A stimulus, right? A stimulus. So if it's affected by a stimulus, we call it a sensory neuron. And it, it has many names because it's, uh, because it's affected. We call it an affector. And we also call it an afferent neuron. The motor neurons, because they're the ones that, that move, that, that do the responding, they are the effect. So we call them efferent neurons or effectors. Okay, so these are just a lot of synonyms, a lot of vocab. Okay, does, does the vocab make sense, guys? Yes. Okay, so, all right, so that covers the basics about how central and peripheral nervous system work. Now let me give you the, the different types of cells within the nervous system. So there's basically two, and we saw them in the video. We call them glia and neurons. And um, some people already submitted the worksheet for the crash course video. So some of you may already know these terms, but I'm gonna review them uh, briefly with you anyway. So we looked at this diagram last time of glia and neurons. And what was the relationship between glia and neurons? Can anyone tell me? What was the relationship between glia and neurons? What's the relationship between glia and neurons?
Anybody? What's the relationship between glia and neurons? They uh, work together. They work together, right? So, so, um, so this is straight from my notes. So the the neurons are are the ones that do all the communication. Okay, the glia are more like the support network and. If you missed Wednesday's video, please watch it, guys, those of you that are watching this video now. But I illustrated on this. So on this picture, the neuron is this thing right here. It's, it's, this, it's this yellow thing right here. Okay? That's the neuron. The, the glia are these things right here. So oligodendrocytes right here. This is an example of a glia, astrocytes are an example of another glia cell, and then we have microglia, okay? So all of these are examples of glias and neurons, but they don't do the same thing. So um, in the video last time, we listed the six different types of glia and the different uh, types of neurons. So let me just review a little bit uh, of that for you, and, and I'll take any questions about them. So, these are the glia, <clears throat> and the, the word glia, it, it, it's, it's just Latin for glue. So literally what they do, as you saw in the pictures, they connect to the neurons because the neurons do all the heavy lifting. The neurons are the ones that allow me to respond to a stimulus. They're the ones that allow me to move and do all these, these things. The glia are, <clears throat> I, I shouldn't say they're just the glue, but they are primarily there to support what the neurons do, okay? So these are the four glia found in the central nervous system only. So they're the astrocyte, the microglia, the ependymial cells, and the oligodendrites, like we saw in the video. So if, if this is foreign to you, please watch that, that video I posted last week, last Wednesday, I should say. And then satellite and, and Schwann cells. So let's take a look at what these are. Okay, so the four different types of glia cells. Can you read us this, please? How about um, how about Daniel? Can you read us the first two types of glia cells, and I'll explain them for you. The first two are the astrocyte and the microglia. And can you read us what they do, please? Oh. And I'll, I'll explain. Oh, um, that's just the most abundant surrounds and protects neurons, also responsible for exchange of material between neurons and capillaries. The microglia acts as immune defense against infectious agents and repair damage. Good, thank you. So as you can see on this picture here, the astrocytes are pretty much found everywhere. They're the most common of all the glia, and they're, they're just like Daniel said, they, they offer uh, connection between them and, and capillaries uh, directly. The microglia, these are like specialty uh, glia. Uh, their only job is really to help you fight infection. If you think about it, you have glia cells in your brain, and the reason that you don't really get infections in your brain is because of these microglia. Their job is to get rid of uh, things that aren't supposed to be in your, in your brain. That's another reason why sleep is so important, guys, because uh, your, your brain doesn't have like a, a filtration system. It doesn't just flush things out on its own. But the microglia help with that. The microglia make sure that things get removed from, from the brain. Uh, the next two, can you read this please? How about Anna? They're called the ependymial and the oligodendrites. Epidemial cells secrete cerebral spinal fluid in the cavities of the brain and spinal cord on offer protects the organs. Oh, yeah. Sorry, that's a typo. <laughs> Go ahead. How do you pronounce the other one? Oligodendrites. Oligo oligodendrites form insulating barrier around axons called millennial mill. Myelin, myelin, myelin sheath. And actually, let me show you a picture. Myelin. The myelin sheath, guys. Um, so on a, on a typical uh, neuron, um, this is review. 
remember we said there's parts and I drew it. That was on Monday's video in case you weren't here. Um, what were the parts of a basic neuron? Does anyone remember? Like, like what's the central part here? Nucleus. That's the nucleus, right? And what do we call these little tree-like structures here? The little branches? Dang. The what? It's right here. A dendrite? Yeah, they're called dendrites. And the axon is this long, like the, it's kind of like the, the tail of the neuron. But you see this little blue layer on the outside that acts like an insulator? That's called the myelin sheet. And as you can see here, Anna, like you just told us, the oligodendrites are what kind of form an outer layer around the neurons called the myelin sheet. Does that, does that make sense? And the reason that those are so important, guys, the myelin sheath, the myelin sheath is actually the reason that signals are able to be sent as quick as they can uh, through a neuron. There are lots of uh, diseases like um, uh, um, where the myelin sheath actually starts to wear out in a neuron cell. And what that does is it, it causes signals to be sent slower uh, in your neuron, which means that the response of a person is slower. Um, so the more myelin sheath you have, usually the faster your reaction time to something is. And so um, one of the cool little labs that I was gonna have us do in class was to test how fast you are, because you can actually test your nervous system response, like quickness, like a ninja, by seeing how fast your myelin sheath works by seeing how quickly you can react to something. So I'll see if I can find a way to have you guys maybe demonstrate through video to me, you testing your myelin sheath. But for now, let's just, let's, let, we'll do that later. But just know that the oligodendrites, like Anna told us, they offer the myelin sheath. And the myelin sheath is super important for conducting signals across a neuron. So they're a good thing. The other types are called the satellite and the Schwann cells. Can you read us these, please, Damari? Satellite glia and Schwann cells. Surrounded and support neurons similar to astrocytes. Mm -hmm. And then form insulating, insulating barrier and axons called myelin and sheath. Myelin sheath, yeah. So what the, what the satellite glia does, like, uh, Damari just told us, they're basically just like the astrocytes, okay? They support, and again, on this picture, you see how it's offering the support to the neuron? Um, the, the satellites, they do the same exact thing, okay? The Schwann cells, like you also said, do the same exact thing as the myelin. So then what's the difference between Schwann's and oligodendrites? What's, what's the difference? Why are they different things if they do the same thing? Why are we calling them different things if they if they do the same thing, guys? They're located in different parts. Exactly, exactly Anna, because they're located in different parts of the nervous system. So, so the astrocyte, like Damari just told us, is the equivalent of the satellite in the peripheral. The oligodendrites, what was it equivalent, Damari? You just told us. What was the equivalent of the oligodendrite? What was the equivalent of the oligodendrite? Anyone? Schwann cells. Yeah, the, the Schwann cells. The Schwann. Schwann. I know they're, they're big vocab words, guys. Um, but again, that's why you have these notes on Schoology. And of course, you can use them at any time. Okay. But I, again, um, I know it's a lot of vocab. Um, that's why I'm letting you work at your own pace. I know this is a lot of information. This is two chapters, guys. So give us all some credit. Like you're learning all this in this amount of time. This is what they study in medical school. So you guys are doing fantastic, okay? Um, so besides the big vocab words, what questions do you have about glia cells? Besides the vocab and how to pronounce them. Do we kind of get what they do? Thumbs up if you get it. Thumbs down if, if you want me to repeat. Okay, and again, just, 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 it, the vocab, I know they're hard to pronounce, they're hard to say, but literally their definitions are here. 
Um, all you really, really need to know is, like Anna told you, some are found here and some are found there, okay? So that's the glia. And like we said, the glia, their main job, and I'll put this in italics for those of you watching the video, their main job is to support. <clears throat> um, the neurons, though, these are the fancy guys. These are the ones that we owe everything to. The, the reason that you guys are able to take your AP exams, the reason that you're able to play sports, the reason that you're able to paint and draw and play guitar is because of your neurons. Your neurons are what do everything in your body, okay? So let's talk about neurons. Neurons, like we saw in the video, and um, for those of you that weren't here on Monday, we drew a picture of a typical neuron, and uh, you guys just helped me label all the parts, right? So we said we have the dendrites, we have the axon, um, we have the myelin sheath, which we just saw. Um, so this is a basic neuron, okay? However, of course, we give them different names, right? So we have neurons based on uh, usually two separate things. One is um, how many processes they have. And a process is just a projection. It's the things that stick out, okay? And let me show you a picture of that. So these are the, the three major types of neurons in your nervous system. And they're kind of named that way because of what they look like, in other words, right? How many processes they have. So we'll start with the easiest one. The easiest one's called the multipolar neuron. And multi in the sense that it has many projections, right? It has this big axon, and then it has many, many dendrites, okay? So that's called a multipolar neuron. Pole just means um, opposite ends, okay? So it has um, axons on this side, dendrites on this side. This is called a bipolar neuron. A bipolar neuron, bi meaning two, you'll notice that it has on one side, it has its axon, on the other side, it has its dendrites. And let me go to the definition so this is a little clearer for you, okay? So multipolar, like we just said, has many different processes. It has one to two axons on that picture I just showed you, it only had one axon, but it has many dendrites, right? Which you can see here. So one axon, many dendrites. Next is the bipolar. Bipolar just means two processes, and those processes are the axon and the dendrite, which you can see here, right? The axon, the dendrite. The unipolar is unique, and actually unipolars are only found in one part of your body. And actually, let me go back to my example, sorry. So multipolar, the, the perfect example of a multipolar is a motor neuron. Because motor neurons, they're, they're the ones that need to do all the movement. They're the ones that need to react all the time. So they have many dendrites, okay? So the perfect example of a multipolar neuron would be a motor neuron. And remember, the synonym for, for motor, things that, that cause an effect, we call those efferent. A unipolar only has the one end. Right? It has the one end that has everything, the axon and the dendrite all on one end. And so because they're the ones that get affected and send the signal to, to your brain, to your spinal cord, uh, so sensory neurons are affected, so we call them afferent neurons. Okay? Um, the other way that we categorize neurons is by their function. So there's three. And we already talked about them. So this is actually review. We call them sensory because like we saw, they get affected. They get affected by what again? Daisy, do you remember? What do sensory neurons get affected by? Starts with an S? Stimulus. A stimulus, right? So if it's affected by uh, a stimulus, that could be a delicious hamburger smell or delicious, delicious, uh, uh, anything, right? Or it could be poking, or it could be some hot uh, thing touching your hand or something cold. Whatever the stimulus is, that sends um, a signal through these sensory neurons um, to the brain. Motor neurons, remember, they get, uh, they're the ones that do the effect itself, so we call them efferent, and they're the ones that send the signal 
to the muscles and the glands so that they can move. And then the, the, the word that I've been talking about that in science means movement is motor. So we call them motor neurons. They move, whereas sensory neurons, they receive stimulus. The last type of neuron, and we're gonna pause here, the last type of neuron is called the interneuron because the interneurons are the gateway, the communication between the sensory and the motors. Does that make sense, guys? Yes. Okay, who'd like to summarize for me uh, the differences between uh, the, the neurons we talked about? Who'd like to summarize for me neurons? So I know you understand me. And you can actually explain it to me with an example if that helps you like like we can go back to our uh, stubbing of the toe or poking of the foot whatever and use these words for me somewhat let's go back to the original example trujillo steps on a nail how can you explain neurons to me and all their uh types would like to do that So like if you step on a nail, the sensory or the afferent neuron. So like, oh, the nail is like, just, okay. Um, so the, the nail is a stimulus. Mm -hmm. Good. And the, and the afferent neurons carry that sensory input from, to the brain. Good. And then the motor neuron moves your foot away from the nail. Okay. And so like that's yeah. Like, yeah, that's, that's basically it, Daisy. And so and so, um, would a sensory neuron be a multipolar, unipolar, or bipolar neuron? Unipolar? Yeah, so the sensory neurons, I put it here, sensory neurons yeah. are unipolar because they just receive that signal. They receive the stimulus. That's all they do. That's all they do. So they don't need to have all of these dendrites. They don't need to have all these projections like a multipolar. So the, the sensory guys is always going to be unipolar because they just receive. And I'll, I'll, I mean, I won't write it on here because I don't want to confuse people, but. Um, the unipolars, they're just the ones that get the signal, the stimulus. The multipolar are the ones that do all the movement, okay? So, uh, thank you, Daisy. Um, some more naming. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things we, 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 we use to name them based on where they are. In the peripheral nervous system, we call a bundle of axons, excuse me, we call that a nerve. The same exact thing in the central nervous system we call it a tract, but it's the equivalent. Another thing that I want to cover that's kind of different is a collection of nerves. In a CNS, we call a nucleus, whereas in a PNS, we call that a ganglion. And so let me show you a picture of what that looks like right here. So on here, you'll notice that this bundle of, of nerves, uh, we call it a, a, a ganglion because it's part of the peripheral nervous system. But if it was like a bundle of nerves, like up here, we would just call it a nucleus. So it's just some naming, it's semantics. It's, it's not a big deal. I probably shouldn't have even covered that with you. Don't worry. I know that that part gets real confusing. But um, let me end here with neurotransmitters because I think this is pretty interesting. So now let's talk about how a neuron communicates. Now that we know what neurons are, now that we know what glias are, how do they do anything? How, how am I able to, to move my foot away in Daisy's example? How am I able to, to pull my hand away because I burn my hand on the stove? The reason is because of something called a neurotransmitter. Okay, so a neurotransmitter is essentially the signal that gets sent from neuron to neuron. Okay, and so I'm going to leave that picture up for a second so you guys can, can, can see what's happening here. 
So let me do some illustrating for you. I'll use red. So on this uh, uh, picture, you see there's one neuron here. The neuron that's gonna send a signal, so we'll call the, the signal, signal, oh my gosh, sorry for my writing. The signal, uh, we call it a neuro transmitter, oh my gosh, transmitter. And this is easy to remember because neuro, right? So neuro and transmit as in send. So the signal that gets sent from this yellow neuron and the one that does the sending guys, we call it the presynaptic. You guys know what pre means? You guys know what before. pre? It means before, right? So it's the one that's gonna send the signal. So the presynaptic neuron, what it's gonna do, it's gonna send the signal that we call the neurotransmitter, okay? So uh, let's say, again, I get poked, right? So I wanna, I wanna move. Well, an electrical signal sends what we call an action potential, which is just another word for like an electrical impulse in our nerves. It sends a signal down the body of the, of the neuron through the axon, along the myelin sheath, and again, the more myelin sheath you have, the more insulated the, the axon, the quicker the response is. So it'll send that signal to the ends of the axon simultaneously. Okay, so it does it all at once. And at the ends of your axon, we have these little uh, cup-like structures. We call this here. We call it the terminus, terminus. And at the end of the term, and terminus just means end, okay? At the end of the terminus, you'll notice they look like little suction cups. And inside there are these little um, things called vesicles. Vesicles are essentially just the thing that stores, it's what stores the neurotransmitters. So they're kept inside vesicles. So once the action potential sends its signal, along the axon, down the terminus, down to each individual um, terminus, the vesicles get prompted to open up and release their neurotransmitter to the neighboring neuron, which we call the postsynaptic neuron. Do you guys know what post means? After. It means after, right? So it's the one that receives the signal after, okay? So that vesicle releases its neurotransmitter in the space between, so right in between this presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron, there's this little space that is called the synapse. The synapse is the space where that signal is released into. Okay, and uh, let me go back to the, the definitions. Maybe that'll help you guys to understand this a little better. So can you read us, please, this slide? How about, uh, how about Daisy? What is a neurotransmitter? Chemical messenger that carries signal between neurons across synaptic gaps known as neurotransmission. Occurs when an action potential travels down axon terminal on presynaptic sending neuron that causes channels to open and release a signal from the vesicles into synaptic gaps slash cleft. Let me signal, go ahead. I'm gonna highlight this in red because that's an important term. Signal diffuses out and reaches receptor site on postsynaptic receiving neuron. Yeah. So I'll highlight postsynaptic. And did I not put pre? I did presynaptic right here. So again, as you saw in the picture, the presynaptic, like Daisy said, is the one that sends the neurotransmitter signal, and the space where that signal is released into from the vesicles, we call that the synaptic gap. So think of it, it's the gap. So, uh, can you guys see my face? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, so here, I'm gonna use my hand to demonstrate this, okay? So if my hand, or my arm, I should say, is the axon, the fingers, in this case, these are the terminus, okay? And at the end of each terminus, there are um, 
there's vesicles and the vesicles are what release the neurotransmitter to the neighboring neuron okay so this is the other neuron okay so that 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 gap between my hand and my fist here that space where the little signals are going to be sent through that is called the presynaptic gap or cleft so which would be the presynaptic uh, neuron this hand or the fist which would be the presynaptic neuron damari the open hand or the fist um i would it be the open hand yeah it's the open one because this is the one that's sending the signal out so what would my closed fist be damari that's receiving my signal so if this is presynaptic what's this one synaptic mm, no so again this is the presynaptic neuron what's the one that receives it called post the post yeah it's the post it's the post synaptic so that's how neurons communicate now that we've talked about them Here's a picture showing you how they communicate. I'll post a video uh, over the weekend that kind of you know, shows you this in action because I think seeing it is a little better than just reading it. Um, maybe that'll be ours. Let's leave that for Monday. That can be one of our little Zoom conversations. I'll post a video on it and I'll have you guys um, kind of draw it out for me like we did with the ECG waves, okay? But uh, I'll pause here. Um, now, let me just tell you that obviously there's lots of neurotransmitters that do many, many, many things. And actually, Damari, I believe your project had neurotransmitters in it. Your health project, what was your health project about? My health project was about the mental, um, like, the, like mental, um, mental health, like how people, like self-image. Do you remember this word here? Was this part of your project, serotonin? It wasn't part of your project? No, I think that one was ABLES. I was ABLE, okay, okay, sorry. I'm confusing projects now. But let me just, let me just end here. Um, neurotransmitters have an amazing like plethora of things they do for you. And there's really two ways they do it. We call them excitatory and inhibitory. Excitatory just means like do more of, okay? So if the neurotransmitter is excitatory, what it does is it increases action potential, meaning it makes things do more. It makes them, it makes things happen quicker, in other words, right? A perfect example of that is, is epinephrine because epinephrine, which we call adrenaline, is what, again, gives us this boost of energy to, to do all these, you know, things like lift weights or save a baby out of a burning fire. So that's an excitatory neurotransmitter. An inhibitory neurotransmitter is something that, that slows down an action potential. And a perfect example of that uh, is, is serotonin. And I thought that was yours, Damari. Um, serotonin, guys, is involved in depression. Now, we've talked about depression. I know not as much as probably we could have. Um, if this was a psychology class, or mental health class, we would talk so much more about it, but please know that these neurotransmitters that I've listed for you are the, the six most important I can find in the book that you need to know about. Endorphins are what we call the, the a lot of drugs, I can say this, a lot of drugs actually um, mimic what, uh, like morphine, for example, is an endorphin. It inhibits pain, so when you break an arm or you're having surgery, um, a lot of times they, they, they give you morphine and drugs tend to mirror what our nervous systems, neurotransmitters do. And so endorphins, just like morphine, what it does is it, it kind of takes away the pain and makes you feel good. That's what euphoria means. Uh, epinephrine, which we've already talked about, that's adrenaline. Histamine is a good one now that allergy season is coming around. Uh, histamine is a neurotransmitter that causes inflammation uh, when there's allergies present. And serotonin is the, the one that regulates mood, sex, appetite, sleep. And lastly, acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that is in control of muscle movement, memory, and learning.
So um, I'll pause there. I know that was a ton. What we'll do on Monday is do something a little more interactive. I don't want to lecture so much. What I want to have you guys do is make sure you reread everything that I that I covered today so that Monday we can watch a video about neurotransmitters and you guys can do me like a little drawing where you guys show me how it works, okay? So we'll pause there. When we get back on Monday, uh, we'll review what we learned today and then we'll get into the brain, which I'm really excited to talk to you guys about, okay? So um, any questions for me about anything we talked about today? Any questions, guys? Guys? No. Okay. Okay, so please make sure you review that. Um, thank you those of you that submitted your projects and thank you to those of you that already started the next nervous system module. Again, I'll try to post the quiz sometime this weekend so that you can go ahead and just kind of finish up the module if you guys are ready, okay? But I'll see you Monday and Monday we'll review neurotransmitters, all right? Have a nice weekend, guys. Bye. And I'm submitting Bye. grades this weekend too, okay? I'm submitting grades. So uh, Damari, don't forget, message me in case you need uh, more support on anything, okay? Okay, thank you. Right. Bye, guys. Bye. Hello. Bye. Uh, hey, uh, Vanessa, actually, I'm going to end this uh, video, and then I'm going to ask you guys to come back in, okay? Uh, uh, oh, okay, bye. It's like last time. Sorry, guys. Come back in. Come